All right, welcome everybody. I, uh, it's a delight to uh, host you for the University of Illinois Cancer Center Distinguished Speaker Lecture. And we have a um, phenomenally distinguished guest, Lou Cantley from Cornell University, Cornell Wow University. Um, the UI Cancer Center hosts a series of external and internal speakers, primarily through our programmatic and uh, programmatic center-wide seminars and sym symposium. However, we also invite key international and well-recognized influencers in cancer research through our distinguished le lecture series. Uh, notably, we recently had Doug Lowy when he was the acting director of the NCI, and for instance, Marge Cody, who is the CEO of ACR, as an example of, of the caliber of speakers that we bring to the UI Cancer Center for our program members, students, and staff to hear from. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Lou Cantley. And in order to introduce Dr. Can Cantley, I'm going to invite uh, Alexander Terry, an MSTP student, to, uh, to provide an introduction, uh, uh, giving us information about Dr. Cantley's backgrounds, background and accomplishments. Terry? Training. He originally received his BS in chemistry from West Virginia Wesleyan College and his PhD from Cornell in biophysical chemistry. He did his postdoctoral training at Harvard and since has been on faculty at Tufts, Harvard, and Weill Cornell Medicine, where he is currently. While at Harvard, he became chief of their new division of signal transduction, was also a founding member of its Department of Systems Biology, and in 2007, he became the director of the Beth Israel Deganus Cancer Center. He moved to Weill Cornell Medicine in 2012, where he is currently a professor of cancer biology and the Meyer director of the Sandra and Edward Meyer Cancer Center. Dr. Cantley has made numerous major contributions to science. In particular, Dr. Cantley was the first to discover PI3 kinase and demonstrated its lipid kinase function of phosphorylating phosphatidyl inositols. As many here likely know, it is now appreciated that the PI3K AKT pathway is one of, if not the most frequently activated pathways in human cancer. After these initial discoveries, Dr. Cantley's group demonstrated that PI3K activity was induced by PDGF, insulin, and in response to oncogenic transformation, as well as showing PI3K co-precipitates with the insulin receptor. Finally, Dr. Cantley purified PI3K and demonstrated it was a heterodimer of an 85 kilodalton and 210 kilodalton subunits, which are now called P110 alpha and beta. So to summarize, at the very least, an entire chapter of my college biochemistry textbook came directly from Dr. Cantley's lab, and I haven't even covered his more recent work. Most importantly, many of Dr. Cantley's discoveries have led to druggable targets that are now in clinical trials or approved for clinical use. Without a doubt, Dr. Cantley's work has improved clinical outcomes for patients worldwide. Dr. Cantley is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the AACR Academy, among many other memberships. He's also won numerous prestigious awards, including the Wolf Prize in Medicine, and most recently, the Paul Janssen Award from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, with that, I now hand it over to Dr. Cantley for what should be a really fun and exciting talk titled, PI3 Kinase and Cancer Metabolism. Thank you, Alexander. Let me get my slides up. Can everyone see? Yes, we can. Very good. So I'm going to uh, talk about um, PI3 kinase, but let me first start with my disclosures. I've uh, been involved in starting a number of companies and on the boards of various companies listed here, um, but I uh, will not talk about drugs for many of the companies that I'm involved with. Um, I would point out, as indicated, highlighted in yellow, that uh, I'm a founder of a company called Faith that's generating insulin lowering diets for uh, cancer trials. <clears throat> and I will be talking about such diets today. So I want to start by acknowledging um, uh, the people that uh, really participated in the most recent papers that will play the background for the talk I'll give today. Uh, notably Ben Hopkins and Marcus Goncalves, who are co-authors on uh, this paper we published in Nature a few years ago. 
showing that uh, dietary intervention can dramatically improve responses to PI3 kinase inhibitors. And uh, a clinical trial uh, led by Carlos Arteaga, uh, who was part of a stand-up to cancer team that, that I was uh, fortunate to lead uh, that uh, was interrogating uh, PI3 kinase in phase 1B studies. And I'll be talking about that trial because it really provides the background for uh, understanding the complexity of developing PI3 kinase inhibitors. <laughs> but let me start from the beginning of PI3 kinase. Uh, we found a phosphatidylinositol kinase activity co-purifying with VSARC and with polyomimidyl TCSARC, uh, also activated PDGF receptor and insulin receptor. Um, and, and we were interested in it because the activity was only there when the tyrosine kinases were activated, indicating that it somehow got recruited or activated uh, by these tyrosine kinases. And as we began to characterize the activity associated with the tyrosine kinases, we noticed that enzymatically it was very different from the major PI kinase that you found in a cell lysate. Uh, at that point, no one had purified any PI kinase. We had no idea what, what the enzymes were or how many of them there were. Uh, but enzymatically, and, and I should say that as a graduate student, I really trained as an enzymologist in Gordon, Gordon Hammes' laboratory. Uh, and did hundreds of thin layer chromatographies, I should say. And um, uh, so as an enzymologist, uh, I realized that these two, there were two completely different families of enzymes. And we called them type one and type two for their enzymatic characterizations. And type one was the one that co-purified with tyrosine kinases. And Malcolm Whitman, who registered in my laboratory, set off to purify the type one enzyme and to separate it from the type two. And as he managed to get these uh, enzymes separated, we measured their activities individually. The type one enzyme we noticed on this thin layer migrated the product of that enzyme, uh, the singly phosphorylated phosphatidylinositol product, which is indicated here by PIP, migrated about one millimeter slower than the product of the type two enzyme. And this, uh, we would not have noticed, except for the fact that we could separate them, and invariably, the, uh, this was a very reproducible change in migration. So as a chemist, that clearly indicated to me that chemically these two molecules had to be different. So we set out to figure out why they were different and discovered that the type 1 enzyme was actually phosphorylating phosphatidyl inositol at the 3 position of the inositol ring, <clears throat> while the type 2 enzyme was carrying out a reaction that was known to exist for 30 years uh, phosphorylation at the four position of the inositol ring, which was discovered in 1949. Uh, and so from, from 1949 until 1988, when we published this paper, it was assumed there was only a single uh, single type of singly phosphorylated phosphatidyl inositol. This revealed ultimately what turned out to be a family of, uh, of uh, phosphorylated states of phosphatidyl inositol were totally unappreciated. So in 1987-88, uh, the only two forms of phosphorylated phosphatidyl inositol were PI4P and PI45P2. And the discovery of PI3 kinase ultimately led to the realization that PI could be phosphorylated to three position, the three and the four, and the three, four, and five. And, we, and another seven years later, we discovered that it could also be phosphorylated to five position uh, and the three and the five position. So there's seven forms of phosphatidyl inositol that, that emerged after 1987, 88. Um, PI45P2 had already been characterized in the, in the mid 1980s uh, as playing a role in uh, regulation of cytosolic calcium and protein kinase C. Uh, but the role of these other phosphatidylinositides took many years later to figure out. And there are probably still roles for these that we don't fully understand. But I'm going to focus on the triply phosphorylated lipid in that uh, that lipid is not detected at all in cells in, that are quiescent. You have to add a growth factor for a cell in order for this lipid to appear. And it, it appears within seconds, to, uh, well, 30 seconds to a minute of adding insulin to the cells. You can see appearance of this triply phosphorylated lipid. Uh, 
And as I indicated, we discovered it because of it co-purifying with a variety of oncoproteins, implicating that it was playing a role in cancer. Uh, about 10 years after we discovered PI3 kinase, uh, P10, a tumor suppressor gene on human chromosome 10, uh, which had been purified a few years earlier and predicted to be a protein, kinase, protein phosphatase based on the sequence, was shown by Jack Dixon, who had worked on phosphatase as much of his career, to be dephosphorylating not a protein, but rather the three position of PIP3 as its favored substrate. And this then revealed that not only uh, the, was PI3 kinase uh, frequently opt activated by oncogenes, but P10 was second only to P53, the most frequently deleted tumor suppressor gene. Both of these control the level of this triply phosphorylated lipid, indicating that this lipid must be playing an important role in cancer. So over the ensuing years, we were able to tease out in some detail how this enzyme gets activated. Uh, and also from evolution, we were able to evaluate in flies and worms what part of the signaling network uh, was conserved through evolution. And this is why we focused on insulin, in that if you go back to flies and worms, the only way of activating the PI3 kinase uh, in, in the flies and worms is the insulin receptor. Uh, and uh, the, in fact, the pathway was teased out genetically because it affected the lifespan of, of C. elegans. So uh, what happens then when insulin binds the receptor is it autophosphorylates on tyrosine residues that recruits the IRS family of proteins, IRS1 indicated here. They then get phosphorylated by the insulin receptor at sites that are spaced about 20 residues apart and have the repeating motif of tyrosine, methionine, exmethionine. And in the case of IRS1, I only show one doublet here on a given IRS1, but in fact, a single IRS1 protein uh, has four such doublets uh, that can bind to the two SH2 domains on the regulatory subunit of PI3 kinase P85. And we were able to show with peptide libraries that those SH2 domains were highly selective for phosphotyrosine followed by methionine exmethionine. In fact, that uncovered all the activators of PI3 kinase very quickly just by looking at the sequence. So uh, once in, the enzyme then uh, binds to IRS1, that I'll go into more detail in the next slide of what that does, uh, but it induces a conformational state that opens up the catalytic pocket, but of course it also recruits it to the plasma membrane where the substrate PI45P2 resides and results in PIP3 production. And we were able to show in the mid uh, 1990s, uh, early 1990s, uh, that the triply phosphorylated form of, of uh, PI3, uh, uh, phosphatidyl inositol, and also the PI34P2 molecules could directly bind to the plexional molecule domain of AKT, but they also bind to the plexional molecule domain of an upstream serine threonine kinase called PDK1, which phosphorylates and activates AKT. So these two proteins acutely come to the plasma membrane within a, less than a minute of insulin activation and themselves become activated. And AKT then phosphorylates a host of downstream targets. The ones that I've illustrated here are the ones that are highly conserved back to flies and worms, and therefore we know are fundamental to the role that insulin plays in cellular regulation. And, and uh, starting on the left side, GSK3 phosphorylation event shuts off its activity. In fact, most cases, uh, the phosphorylation events are inhibitory to the function of these proteins. Uh, GSK3 explains how insulin regulates glycogen storage in muscle and liver and other tissues. Uh, uh, AKT phosphorylation of FOXO explains how uh, gluconeogenesis is suppressed in the liver in response to insulin. Uh, TSC2, I'll go into more detail explains how AKT regulates protein synthesis. Uh, AS160 in muscle plays a role in glucose transporter trafficking to the plasma membrane. Uh, and last and the most, the most recent uh, target of AKT relevant to insulin signaling is thyrodoxin interacting protein or TXNIP, uh, which uh, we were able to show uh, suppresses uh, glucose uptake in the cells by transporting the glucose transporter, internalizing the glucose transporter and leading to their 
degradation. Uh, when ATT phosphorylates TX NIP, TX NIP, it results in degradation of TX NIP, allowing glucose transporters to stay on the cell surface. And that explains, in fact, how insulin and other growth factors that activate ATT drive glucose uptake in the cells, is, with a single exception you know, muscle that uses AS160, every other tissue uses TX NIP uh, to regulate glucose uptake. P10, of course, then comes in to turn off the signaling pathway to ensure that insulin doesn't cause acute hypoglycemia, which can result, of course, in death. So if we look at mutations in PI3 kinase, and I'll start out with fortunately a very frequent, infrequent mutation that's seen in this disease, but it's, to me was very informative. And that's a mutation in the C-terminal SH2 domain of the P85 subunit. It's an arginine residue that's directly bind, involved in binding phosphatyrosine, gets converted to some other residue. Uh, unfortunately, this is an uncommon event, but when it occurs, and even in a single allele, it results in what appears to be <clears throat> type 1 diabetes. So you look at these two children on the right here, they're the same age, this very small child here has this mutation and as a consequence fails to thrive. This child was initially thought to be a type 1 diabetic, has all the characteristics of type 1 diabetes, but in fact when they looked, and, uh, looked at the bloodstream there were extremely high levels of insulin uh, and a biopsy of the muscle revealed that the insulin receptor and iris one are high, highly tyrosine phosphorylated. So what happens then, then is that this single mutation interferes with the ability of PI3 kinase to bind to the uh, iris one, and this gives a, an apparent uh, type one diabetes phenotype. And the reason I emphasize this, well, only two, two reasons, because it's important for understanding cancer as well, but importantly, it says that essentially everything insulin does goes through PI3 kinase. <clears throat> so getting to cancer then, there are several hotspot mutations in PI3 kinase in the catalytic subunit indicated here. I won't go into detail, but there are also mutations in P85 that further support the model I'm about to show you. So these two mutations in the so-called PIC domain and C2 domain uh, end up uh, actually four different mutations patients you frequently pick up here, revert in, uh, re charge reversal effects. And these residues are directly involved in forming salt bonds that hold the N-terminal SH2 domain into a pocket in the catalytic domain. And there's a second titer contact made by a coiled coil domain that also holds 85 and 110 together. So these two proteins are held together in a very tight way. Uh, and in, in this conformation, the N-terminal SH2 domain is unavailable to bind to tyrosine phosphorylated proteins. Uh, and the catalytic activity is very low in this conformation because of this interaction with the NSH2 domain. So what happens then when insulin binds the insulin receptor and you get these two phosphotyrosine methionine X methionines, about 20 residues apart, phosphorylated, is the CSH2 domain binds first because it's free to swing in the breeze here and it can hop onto that phosphotyrosine. Once it binds, then the N-terminal SH2 domain by proximity of being close by uh, will now bind to that second phosphotyrosine competing out for the salt bond uh, for holding it in the pocket. This opens up the catalytic pocket so it, the enzyme is now more active uh, it also allows it uh, to be at the plasma membrane where its substrate resides, PI45P2. Uh, and uh, sh I should say that uh, this also helps binding to GTP-loaded RAS, although in the case of insulin signaling, RAS doesn't typically play much of a role. But in other growth factors, it can. Now, what happens then in cancer is you see mutations in the C2 and PIC domain that reverse the charge so that the mutant form of PI3 kinase with these 453 and 545 mutations are, is in the open site conformation all the time. So it has two hands to bind to iris one rather than only one initially, so it can bind more readily. But more importantly, it can hold on for a much longer period of time. So if you've ever tried to hold on to a high bar 
with a single hand versus double hands, you realize that having two hands is a big advantage in staying in that location. And so the consequence then is that insulin will back will activate both the wild type and mutant, but it will hold on to the mutant for a much longer period of time, keeping it active. But you still need, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, you still need insulin in order to get the mutant PI3 kinase to the plasma membrane where it stays in this highly active state. The other hotspot mutation is position 1047. Uh, this, this, what this mutation does is open up some tryptophan residues near the C-terminus of the protein that insert into the plasma membrane and help hold it in the membrane for a longer period of time. And so uh, by a completely different mechanism, it also has the ability to stay at the membrane and be active for a much longer period of time because of this mutation. So I don't want to leave the impression that AKT is the only target or, or PDK1 are the only targets of the phosphoinositides generated by PI3 kinase. Uh, T, I mentioned TSC1 and TSC2 as targets of AKT. I'll get into other uh, proteins that also bind to PIP3 and PI3P2 in the next slide. But if we explore TSC1, TSC2, uh, it, it turns out that what these proteins are normally doing, and we showed this in a collaboration with John Blennis uh, about now almost uh, 12 years ago, is that these phosphorylation events suppress the ability of this complex to act as a gap for a RAS-like protein called REB. REB is normally involved in anchoring when in the GTP bound state of anchoring the raptor tor complex, also called TORC1, <clears throat> at, at the lysosomal membrane, where it ultimately turns on uh, S6 kinase, uh, phosphorylates 4 ebp one and as a consequence, ultimately turns on protein synthesis, but turns on a host of other events required for anabolic processes. So you have to activate this torque complex uh, in order for the cells to start growing. Uh, this complex is called TOR, target of rapamycin, because the drug of rapamycin, which is used for immune suppression uh, for autoimmune disease, uh, turns out to directly bind this complex and discovery of this uh, uh, in yeast as a target for rapamycin uh, resulted in the Lasker Award going to Michael Hall a few years ago. Now, in order to, not only do you need to phosphorylate TSC2 for TOR to be located at the lysosomal membrane, you need other inputs as well, including a number of proteins involved in sensing amino acids that are required for cell growth. Uh, at the RAG2BD uh, complex, uh, for example. Uh, and this work, most of the work done on sensing amino acids was, was discovered by David Sabatini and he continues to reveal additional complexity to how this activation occurs. In addition, however, you also have to keep ATP levels high in order for this TOR to be active. When ATP levels drop, this activates AMP kinase, which then ends up uh, shedding a phosphorylating raptor that will turn off the mTOR complex. This was work done by Ruben Shaw, uh, initiated when he was a postdoc in my laboratory and continued at, at the Salk. So this, uh, uh, we then see that everything in this pathway that turns on TOR is an, uh, an oncogene. Everything in red is an oncogene, PI3 kinase, I should say, RAS can redundantly result in phosphorylation of TSC2 by ERK and RISC to accomplish a similar feat to AKT. Uh, and then everything in blue is the tumor suppressor gene in that they shut off some aspect of the signaling. P10, INPP4B is another phosphatase that breaks down PI34P2 in F1 suppressing RAS activity. So as we get to the uh, cell biology in the clinical trials, one of the markers that we utilize quite frequently now are antibodies against phosphorylated AKT and phosphorylated S6 subunit of the ribosome as convenient readouts that either PI3 kinase is active or TOR is active or both are active. So we'll get back to that later. I don't want to imply that, uh, <clears throat> however, that AKT is the only, and PDK1 are the only PIP3 uh, activated uh, proteins involved in signaling. Uh, they're a family of uh, GEFs for RAC, uh, 
that uh, can be activated by PIP3, uh, GEFs for uh, ARF family members and uh, tech family tyrosine kinases, BTK, for example, also uh, require PIP3 for activation and turning on other downstream signals that are important for cell growth, including activation of RAC, which is, turns out to be quite important for cell growth. And the role of RAC in cell growth, in fact, we were able to show in a collaboration with Gerber and Wolf a few years ago, really has to do, or one of the mechanisms that RAC plays in the cell is, is its ability to uh, depolymerize actin. And it was shown back in the 1970s when I was a graduate student that most of the aldolase in quiescent cells uh, in normal tissues is tied up in actin filaments. So polymers of actin will, will soak up most of the aldolase in the cell. And in order to release aldolase into an active state, you have to mobilize actin. And uh, activation of RAC is one way to do that. Uh, this breaks actin filaments, actin begins to remodel. This causes a, a ruffling effect in the cell, which you can visualize. And in fact, uh, the re pathologist, uh, the, re the main reason pathologists can detect a cancer is because this RAC dependent actin ruffling causes this distortion of shape, which we can see in microscopy as a ruffling phenomenon. But the importance of that is not only does it allow the cell to move around, but it also allows glycolysis to be accelerated this type of step of aldolase. And that turns out to be important because if you don't have high levels of aldolase, you can't go through the non-oxidative pentose phosphate pathway to generate ribose. Uh, and that uh, turns out to be critical for tumor growth that we've, uh, we've uh, characterized. Uh, in addition, this provides uh, three phosphoglycerate, which can be converted into serine and glycine for nucleotide synthesis, uh, base nucleotide base synthesis. So, in order, if you're going to make a lot of nucleosides in a dividing cell, uh, aldolase has to be very active. So, in fact, uh, the first four steps in glycolysis: glucose entry, glucose phosphorylase by hexokinase, uh, activation of uh, phosphofructokinase, all are driven by uh, EKT activation or RAC activation. Now I wanna get into a little more detail about the forms of PI3 kinase that can uh, produce this triply phosphorylated lipid PIP3. I, I focused on PIK3CA gene product, the P85P110 alpha isoform encoded by the gene PIK3CA because that's the one that's frequently mutated in cancer. But there are three other PI3 kinases in human cells that can generate PIP3, PIK3CB, PIK3CD, and PIK3CG. And of these, uh, PIK3CD is a particularly important in lymphocytes, T cells and B cells. And you'll see in a moment uh, that drugs that target this enzyme have, have been approved for B cell lymphomas. Uh, they're drugs against the gamma isoform in clinical trials for treating cancer. These mainly are working through macrophages that require PIK3CG for uh, migration and maintaining it, uh, being maintained in the uh, so-called M2 form of macrophages. Uh, and PIK3CB turns out to be important in prostate cancer, but not in most other cancers. So inhibitors of PIK3CB or alpha plus beta inhibitors uh, are, are of interest in prostate cancer. But keep in mind that insulin only activates PIK3CA. The very form that gets mutated is the insulin-specific responder in cells. And that turns out to be very important for the points that I'll make later in the talk. So here's some of the drugs that have gone into clinical trials and been approved. Adalalisa, the very first PI3 kinase inhibitor to be approved, uh, hits the delta isoform. Uh, but other inhibitors, Duvalisa, uh, hits delta and gamma and copanilis of its uh, uh, alpha and delta. Uh, these drugs are also approved for B-cell lymphomas. So these, all of these drugs got approved pretty quickly. The trials went through very smoothly, no huge complications other than the fact that patients tend to get infected when their B-cells are suppressed. But it's been a struggle to get inhibitors of the alpha isoform of PI3 kinase approved. There is now one approved drug, uh, uh, BYL, 719 called alpalisib. It's also called now as a commercial name, PCRE. Uh, 
but it took uh, more than 12 years from the time this drug first went into patients until it got approved. And I'll put you through some of the struggles of, of why this drug took so long to get approved. Um, and, and I should say there are a number of drugs that went all the way to phase three trials, and I'll talk in some detail about GDC-032, uh, which, uh, uh, in my opinion, should have been approved if the trial had been done properly. Uh, BKM-120, ultimately uh, developed by Novartis, uh, went through phase three trials, met many of the endpoints, but uh, has such a significant toxicity that's an off-target toxicity and therefore was withdrawn. The biggest problem with targeting uh, the form of PI3 kinase that's activated in tumors is that if you hit both the wild type and the mutant, then you, ex as expected, should get acute insulin resistance because you're turning off the single enzyme that we know is absolutely required uh, for insulin responses in uh, liver, muscle, and fat, and other tissues as well. And that's been the problem. And I'll go into some detail then for the rest of the talk of why this has been a problem and how we're trying to get around it. But before I get to that, I'm gonna give you a little more detail about other diseases related to PI3 kinase. And they're also understanding this insulin connection is critical for understanding some of these diseases. So first, just focus just on cancer and where do you see mutations in PIK3CA in cancer? And the champion here is uh, uterine cancers, uh, where the green here in the, indicates activating mutations, the ones that I showed you in this earlier slides. The red indicates amplifications, the gray indicates that in the same tumor you see both amplifications and mutations. And you can see that uterine really dominates here. Uh, however, more than a third of breast cancers have mutations in PIK3CA. They're the ER positive subtype type primarily prevails there. But cervical cancers, ovarian, colorectal, um, all have these uh, mutations. If, if we, uh, what we noticed right off, even early ago, 10 years ago, as mutations were coming in, is that women's cancers more often have mutations in this pathway than other types of cancers. And we were able to get funding from Stand Up to Cancer and AACR to assemble a team uh, with $15 million to explore the PI3 kinase inhibitors in women's cancers in drug combinations that might improve their responses. And, that, uh, and I'll talk about those trials. Uh, P10, of course, is also lost in numerous cancers, in fact, more frequently than activating mutations in PI3 kinase. The light blue indicates a single oil loss, and we know a single oil loss is sufficient to drive the disease. Uh, dark blue indicates uh, double low loss. Uh, and then here I've also included the PIK3CA mutations in green. Uh, and um, you can see now most of the major cancers that cause deaths in America have either P10 loss or PIK3CA activation. But you see the same PIK3CA mutations you see in cancer can also occur in other diseases. So there's a mosaicism disease, in, in which case there's not a germline mutation picked through CA, but there's a mutation picked up in the embryo, at early stage in the embryo, embryonic development, that's the same mutation that you see in cancer. And these don't really result initially in cancers. They might sometimes progress to cancers, but they, in children, they, get, uh, they appear as areas of overgrowth. If it's late in embryonic development, it may just be at the tip of a toe or so. If it's early, it could be an entire leg or even half of a body. Uh, in the case where you see these mutations uh, that are quite, that cause these major overgrowths, the patients actually have hypoglycemia because insulin is driving more glucose into this affected tissue than into uh, muscle. Uh, in fat, and this, uh, this can cause uh, a lot of problems. If these mutations happen in the brain, they result in epileptic seizure syndromes. Uh, and uh, it, it was discovered uh, in dealing with children with these epileptic seizure syndro syndromes that they occur primarily after children have had sugary drinks to drink or icing from cake. Uh, this causes uh, these epileptic seizures to come on. Uh, 
and they realized that if they kept the patients on diets with very low carbohydrates, very low rapid release carbohydrate, that this would block uh, ketogenic diets in these children. And these diets were called ketogenic diets because they also called ketos, called ketosis. But we, what we now know to me argues that almost certainly the reason these diets work in children is because they prevent uh, insulin levels from a- activating PI3 kinase in these neurons uh, that, that fire to cause the epileptic seizure. So in fact, uh, epi- uh, dietary interventions are being considered in all these other over- overgrowth syndromes for the same reason. So back to our, our model here, I, as I said, everything in red is a, a oncogene, everything in blue is a tumor suppressor gene. And it turns out these uh, uh, genes in blue can not only occur in these overgrowth syndromes as loss of function, but they can also appear as germline loss of functions. And even a single little loss of these genes uh, and, and germline uh, can result in, syn- in hamartoma syndromes. And these are some examples of hamartoma syndromes. P10 loss uh, results in Cowden's disease which typically has a lot of uh, polyps, polyposis syndrome, uh, but gross on the skin and other tissues. Uh, LKB1 loss results in pooch Jager syndrome, uh, similar, somewhat similar to P10 loss. TSC1 or TSC2 loss results in tumor sclerosis where you get these skin overgrowths, uh, but can also result in lymphangiomyomatosis, a lung infiltration disease. And neurofibromatosis results from uh, loss of NF1, the gap for RAS. So they all have similar phenotypes, although the clinician can easily tell these apart. So since activating piatri kinase results in glucose influx in the tumors and acceleration of every step in glycolysis almost, uh, we'd expect the tumor that has a PIK3C mutation should have take up glucose readily and there should easily be detectable by fluorodeoxyglucose PET. Uh, so we explored this in the early clinical trials with our stand up to cancer team. And this was a trial that, uh, this is a patient who went on a trial, one of the first, first trials we did uh, and uh, for breast cancer patients with pic 3 ca mutations. So this is, was a 51 year old woman. Uh, she was ER positive, PR positive, HER2 positive, and had a PIK3CA mutation, the H1047R mutation. Uh, she went on standard of care, uh, initially Lupron and Herceptin, uh, progressed on those, went on Lapatinib, and now uh, she then went on to a clinical trial, uh, interdark phase one trial of our standard to cancer team of combining alpalisib. Uh, the PR3, PI3K alpha specific inhibitor uh, with uh, letrozole to, uh, to treat her for, uh, uh, to see whether we could affect her disease. So as soon as she went on the trial, or before she went on the trial, we did an FGG PET and you could see these liver mets, which is pretty common in, in breast cancer patients. Uh, and this is the same patient uh, one month later uh, after being on the drug and you can see the liver mets no longer appear. By other imaging modes, she still has tumor there. It's just not taking up glucose. But over the next year or so, this tumor shrunk and she clearly had a very good response, uh, but ultimately progressed. So it wasn't a cure, but it clear, showed effects that told us that the drugs that we the level of the drug that we could achieve was sufficient to have some effect on at least her tumor. So this is a swim plot of the patients that went on to that phase 1B trial. We call it a phase 1B because at this stage we're escalating the dose of the uh, uh, alpalisib uh, in the presence of letrozole, uh, the ER uh, antagonist pathway um, drug. And um, so we, since it was a phase 1B study, we included women who didn't have mutations uh, to accelerate uh, getting to the, uh, the, the clinical dose that we we're going to use for the phase two study. And you can see that uh, surprisingly, all, of course, all the women who went on this trial had already failed standard of care and had progressive disease. And so to stay on this trial for over a year with no progression indicated there must be some value to these patients who had no PIK3CA mutation. 
So that was surprising to us uh, and also surprising to us and somewhat depressing to us, more than half the patients who did have PIK3C mutations failed to see a clinical response. Uh, but there were enough responses here that encouraged us to con continue with the study. Now, I should say that when we agreed, to, this was a Novartis drug, and when we talked to Novartis about uh, working on this phase 1B trial with them, they, uh, uh, you know, they called in endocrine consultants uh, because uh, we anticipated there should be hyperglycemia if you give a PI3 kinase inhibitor. And the endocrine consultants, when they looked at the patients, they immediately wanted to give them insulin because the, insulin, the glucose levels would go up very high. But I insisted with Novartis that we not give the patients insulin because we knew that insulin would reactivate PI3 kinase. And so we insist the patients stay on metformin uh, and uh, tr were coached to avoid drinking sugary drinks while, while they were on the study. And anyone who couldn't be managed on metformin had to go off to trial. So it turns out that roughly half the patients we tried to enroll in this phase 1B trial, uh, the very first dose of uh, the drug showed such hyperglycemia that the endocrinologist insisted they had to have insulin and they immediately went off the trial. So that's how we uh, stayed, that's how we uh, carried out the phase one study. This drug, this combination of switching to fulvastrant, I should say, rather than letrozole, but keeping BYL719 dose, uh, we then went on to phase two and a phase three trial. And Novartis, to their credit, stuck with the recommendation that anyone who could not be managed on metformin had to go off the trial. And the drug was approved in May 2019. And um, that was, of course, very exciting to finally get an alpha specific inhibitor approved after more than 10 years of many companies trying to get them approved. Uh, and as I said, uh, this, the, the insistence was that uh, the patients could not go on glucose. Now, the truth was that this was not a home run. Uh, this was 11 month life extension uh, only five and a half months compared to fulvastrant alone. But clearly the PI3 kinase inhibitor was doing more than the fulvastrant, but only giving them an extra five and a half months. So to me, this was great, but I wasn't really cracking open the champagne to say we've cured breast cancer with PI3K inhibitors. And in fact, what we learned as I talked to the clinicians who were administering this drug is that the reason they only get additional five and a half months is they become extreme hyperglycemic after about you know, five to six months of taking the drug. And the endocrinologists insist on giving them insulin. And as soon as they get insulin, the tumor progresses again. So <clears throat> that's the, the problem we ran into. Now in parallel, in fact, uh, starting a little later, Genentech and Roche brought their PI3 kinase inhibitor, GDC032, into an approval trial as well, that drug uh, also called tasolizib, in our hands looked, uh, if anything, better than alpalizib uh, in, in the studies that uh, we looked at both in mice and in, in looking at the phase one studies. Uh, and yet uh, it failed, that drug completely failed, no life extension at all for adding that drug. And in inquiring with Genentech as to how the trial was designed, first of all, I should say that that drug, that trial started a year after Novartis and finished a year earlier than Novartis's trial. It took them only half as long to enroll the same number of patients. And the reason was that they weren't excluded from the trial if they developed hyperglycemia on metformin. In fact, they relied on the endocrinologist to decide how to treat the patients when they got hyperglycemia. And no doubt, most of the patients ended up getting insulin or insulin secreted box. So why? Is that a problem? Okay, so let's suppose you eat pasta or you're brave enough still to put sugar in your coffee and uh, your glucose levels are going to go up very quickly. Uh, and this is going to tell the pancreas to release insulin. Insulin then goes to the liver and suppresses gluconeogenesis. It also drives glycogen storage and drives glycogen storage in muscle and fat storage in fat cells. And that brings the glucose level back down again and um, allows uh, everything to come back to homeostasis. Uh, 
Now, if you happen to have a small tumor growing somewhere in your body and that tumor in particular, if it has a PIK3CA mutation, will thrive on that insulin. As I indicated, insulin is by far the best way to, act to activate PI2 kinase. And if you have those mutations, the activation will continue for a long period of time, long after the insulin levels will come back to normal. And that explains why we see the glucose uptake into those tumors. So that's you know, an issue that we're trying to avoid. If you happen to be insulin resistant, then insulin levels, uh, the pancreas has to spit out more insulin because uh, the muscle and, and the liver are, do not respond as well to insulin. But again, the tumor responds perfectly well to insulin, particularly if it has a PIK3CA mutation. So this period of insulin resistance is a very dangerous time for patients uh, that where you know, the pancreas can still make lots of insulin uh, but uh, the liver muscle don't respond, but the tumor still does. And we know there's a strong correlation between insulin resistance and endometrial cancer. And we don't think that's uh, coincidental since endometrial cancer has the most frequent mutations in PIK3CA. So uh, of course, if you're insulin resistant and you still continue on a high, high glycemic diet, uh, you're further exacerbating your problems. I should also say that if you go to the CBIO portal, and look at the 20,000 or so tumors uh, that have been uh, undergone uh, full genome sequencing or full uh, exome sequencing uh, and ask, you know, what are, do any of them have amplification of insulin receptor IRIS-1 or IRIS-2, the proteins that mediate insulin signaling? And it turns out there is a significant subfraction that do have elevation in these uh, uh, amplification or gain in these genes. And if you take that subset of patients across all tumors that have these applications and ask, what is their overall survival at Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see they only, they die almost twice as fast as patients who don't have those amplifications, indicating that ambient insulin levels turning on that pathway is no doubt contributing to the death of many patients. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Now, as I say, our, our studies really followed insulin levels in patients, but we, we know that, it, that we can control what mice eat a lot better than we can control what humans eat. So let's go back to the mouse again and see what we can learn from looking at PI3 kinase inhibitors uh, and responses in mice. So this is a mouse that, that could have shown human data would look virtually identical to this. You give one of these PI3 kinase inhibitors uh, BYL719, again, is the drug that was approved. Uh, Alpalisib, GDCO32, is tasolisib, the, the Genentech drug that was not approved. These drugs uh, all look pretty much identical at their clinical dose uh, in, in causing hyperglycemia in the mouse. And what bothered me about uh, these observations and what bothered me about the patient observations is that the hyperglycemia did not continue as long as I expected it to because these drugs are quite long lasting drugs. And so they should have stayed at a therapeutic dose for two to three hours uh, or even longer. And yet the glucose you can see is starting to come back down. And so we explored why does that glucose come back down? And the reason is because you're getting massive amounts of insulin release from the pancreas, both in the human patients and in the mice. So we see severe hyperinsulinemia in the patients and in the mice. And you can see uh, all three drugs cause this. And that's because the glucose is going up so high, it's stimulating the pancreas to release as much insulin as it can. So if you were to give a patient these levels of insulin and it was a normal healthy patient, the patient would die. So that uh, tells you how much, how dramatic this elevation in insulin is. The reason they're not dying is because the PI3 kinase is preventing that insulin from fully activating uh, Kinase. So uh, we decided to look ex vivo at uh, some human cancers that have PIK3CA mutations to see what happens if we control the insulin level. So this is an endometrial cancer with a PIK3CA mutation, actually two different organoids and two different colors here. And we titrate them in with the pan PI3 kinase inhibitor BKM120. And you can see both organoids at the therapeutic dose, about two micromolar you get essentially every cell in that organoid is killed. So that says, yes, at the therapeutic dose, we sh it should be able to kill these tumors. Uh, 
and there's no insulin in this ex vivo experiment. But if we add the level of insulin that you see at this uh, about 15 to 20 minutes into the therapy in vivo, we, which is about 10 uh, nanograms per mil, at that level, we've already rescued half the cells in the organoid. That insulin is protecting them from being killed by the PI3 kinase inhibitor. And why is that so? Well, it's because we knew in great detail that they're spare PI3 kinases and spare insulin receptors. And so when you go to very high insulin, you can ultimately cause much more activation of PI3 kinase and overwhelm the ability of the inhibitor to turn it back off again. And so here's, here's the level of AKT growing in the tumor without adding insulin. Uh, we now add insulin and we see activation, further activation of AKT. We add BKM120, completely shut it off. But if we add that dose of 10 nanograms per mil insulin, we fully bring back, almost fully bring back activation of AKT again. And you also see activation of S6 downstream. So this tells us that at the level of insulin we're seeing in vivo and the therapeutic dose of, of PI3 kinase inhibitor, that we're, we are not keeping the pathway turned off effectively at, after 15 minutes or so. So unless you've killed the tumor in the first 15 minutes, uh, by then uh, the insulin is starting to rescue it. So uh, we then uh, ask, how can we keep the uh, uh, insulin level down? And so there are a number of ways, in fact, more ways today than there were 10 years ago when we started uh, the clinical trials to keep glucose levels low. Uh, insulin obviously is what the endocrinologist always resorts to. I should say my brother's an endocrinologist and uh, just retired recently. <laughs> he had thousands of patients on insulin in North, North Carolina. Uh, and, that, and that's something we want to avoid. Um, there are also insulin secretagogues that are very popular for treating uh, insulin resistance. Uh, and they, they uh, stimulate insulin secretion from the pancreas, so they're also gonna raise insulin. Metformin it, it was a drug of choice 10 years ago when we started the studies because we knew it would not raise insulin, it would help keep insulin down, but there are better drugs today, including sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitors, which block glucose reabsorption in the kidney. And as a result, that hyperglycemia goes it results in hyper uh, glucose levels in the urine, uh, but that keeps uh, insulin down as well. Uh, these drugs were not available when we started our trials. And then of course there are dietary interventions. I talked about the ketogenic diet, the low carbohydrate diet, that's very effective at blocking insulin stimulation of, of epileptic seizures. So we explored these various ways of intervening uh, and uh, focusing on the sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor and, uh, and the ketogenic diet, two things that we knew we could do in a clinical trial very, very quickly. And you can see that if you acutely, just at the same time <clears throat> that you give the PI3 kinase inhibitor, you also give a sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor, you can uh, certainly blunt and bring the glucose level down pretty effectively. Uh, metformin only slightly blunts this peak so it's not as effective as the sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor. That's what we see in patients as well. That's why these drugs got approved. Uh, the ketogenic diet is somewhere in between in these two in this study. Uh, but if you, this is putting the mouse on the ketogenic diet the same day as the drug. But if we put the mouse on the ketogenic diet for a week to lower glycogen storage <clears throat> and then give the PI3 kinase inhibitor, it's actually more effective than the sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor, <clears throat> excuse me, keeping glucose down. Uh, and you can see on the right, uh, C peptide of insulin, this is the insulin maturation peptide, which is a way of monitoring over some period of time what the insulin level is. And the ketogenic diet is far better uh, than metformin, you can see in keeping uh, insulin levels low during PI3 kinase inhibitor treatment. So we tested these then in tumors that were grown subcutaneously in the mouse. We're now back to these endometrial tumors that have the PIK3CA mutation that we looked at ex vivo. We now plant them in the flank of a mouse and we then test the mouse. First of all, we just evaluate the mouse on a normal child diet, no drug, no dietary intervention. And you can see some brown stain here indicating 
uh, we're using an antibody against the autophosphorylation site on the insulin receptor, that there's quite a bit of insulin receptor signaling going on in the tumor under ambient chow diets. We now put that mouse on the ketogenic diet for a week, and you can see now that the uh, uh, phosphorylation insulin receptor in the tumor has dramatically subsided. However, if we give the mouse a PI3 kinase inhibitor, you can see this massive increase in autophosphorylation of the insulin receptor. So that elevation of insulin I showed you in a couple of slides back is resulting in dramatic activation of insulin signaling in the tumor. If we give the mouse the ketogenic diet for, for a week first and then give them the PI2 kinase inhibitor, we can almost completely turn off that insulin signaling uh, in the tumor. But we also wanted to look downstream at uh, S6. What's happening to phospho S6 uh, indicating whether mTOR is active or not. And we can see that uh, in these tumors uh, that in the presence of uh, uh, BKM120, we are not effectively shutting off uh, S6 in these tumors. Uh, and again, this is the same tumor as in the previous slide. If we give uh, and this is, uh, uh, in fact, all four of these slides are in the presence of the PI3 kinase inhibitor. So S6 is quite high, in spite of the fact that we've given a therapeutic dose of a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Uh, metformin lowers it a little bit if you quantify this, uh, but the sodium glucose cotransporter inhibitor dramatically drops the S6 activation in the tumor, and the ketogenic diet completely turns it off. So this, this really tells us that if we can uh, put the mice or human patients on these diets or these sodium glucose transporter inhibitors, we should be able to get much more effective killing of tumors with the PI3 kinase inhibitors. So the last, last slide then, the last data slide then shows that in fact, this is absolutely the case. So this is a um, PIK3CA mutant triple negative breast cancer allograph uh, in, in uh, a mouse. Uh, in, in multiple mice. Uh, and we then evaluated the uh, growth of the tumor under a variety of conditions. And you can see that uh, adding PI3 kinase inhibitor alone really doesn't slow down the tumor very much. Ketogenic diet alone doesn't change the tumor growth very much. But if we give a ketogenic diet and the PI3 kinase inhibitor alpha lysib, these tumors completely go away. So this is pretty exciting. Uh, it, it, it indicates that uh, by keeping the insulin down, uh, we can really cause a dramatic response. But more critically, to prove that this is really due to the insulin, we tried an additional study in which we gave the ketogenic diet and alpha -lysib, but at the same time we injected the alpha -lysib, we also injected insulin. And you see now in black, uh, or in, in this uh, diamonds, uh, purple diamonds, that under this condition, the tumors now, now go right back to growing again. So this absolutely shows that it's the insulin that's keeping these tumors alive and growing. So with that, then we, uh, we decided that uh, we would go into the clinic uh, and try dietary interventions and or sodium glucose cotransporter inhib inhibitions to try to see if we can improve responses to drugs that are already approved. And so this, uh, there are three different trials here that we are in the process of doing. Uh, one of them, a neoadjuvant endometrial cancer study that uh, Marcus Goncavas, who's, who's uh, should say an MD, PhD endocrinologist, designed all three of these trials. Uh, and uh, and these trials, we actually give the patients the meals. So they come in on Monday morning, they get an ice chest full of 21 meals that are all ketogenic. They are, we vary the, vary the food quite a bit, but we maintain that they only have 8% carbohydrate uh, and uh, that it's typically asparagus and spinach uh, rather than uh, pasta. And so this, um, these patients we were able to show would comply with these diets. They all lost weight uh, and which they needed to because endometrial cancer patients are typically overweight. Uh, and this, uh, this just demonstrated that we could actually get the patients to maintain these diets if we provide them to the patients. Uh, 
The second trial is a trial with Bayer's uh, Capanilisib, which is approved for lymphoma. They want to extend it into endometrial cancer. So we will be using uh, their drug in, again, in the setting of a ketogenic diet provided to the patients. And then the third trial is a trial in combination with working together with Novartis. And that study uh, will be Alpalisib, as I pointed out, already approved for ER positive breast cancer patient, HER2 negative. And we're going to explore whether uh, with three arms, whether just standard of care with that drug versus the sodium glucose cotransporter inhibitor addition on the drug or the ketogenic diet with, with the drug <clears throat> to see whether we can get uh, improved uh, responses beyond uh, what we see with the drug alone. Uh, so that's uh, the story. And again, these are the people involved in, in the clinical trial and the uh, mouse study that I focused on in, in the talk. And I just want to also acknowledge former and ongoing collaborators in PI3 kinase over the years, particularly pointing out my long-term collaborator, Tom Roberts and, and Jean Zhao and Gerberg Wolf, all, all at Harvard. Uh, John Belenis, uh, now at Wall Cornell with me, uh, long-term collaborator as well, all the way back to the 80s. Uh, and uh, I also want to point out Jose Veselga, who really led our clinical trials and uh, our stand-up to cancer team, the breast clinical trials. And I, I think some of you may know that he just passed away uh, uh, a little over a week ago. A very sad story. Uh, so with that, I will finish. I'll just list a few other long-term collaborators back from the 80s. Uh, on the PI3 kinase story as well. So, and glad to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cantley. It was, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. yes. So that was I'll uh, unshare my slides unless somebody wants to keep them on. Yes. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. And I, I, I just commend you on starting out as an enzymologist and taking us through this path as a molecular and structural biologist, but then in essence, ending with a discussion of nutrition, you know, which I think is really valuable for our trainees to see how your career path has utilized so many different considerations of human physiology and disease to make an impact in this particular case. So thank you so much for that lecture. I should say that uh, I actually learn more from my graduate students and postdocs than I teach them. Uh, and I've always had fantastic graduate students and postdocs coming at me from all kinds of different directions, many of them MD, PhDs. Oh, thank you for saying that. They're the, ones, they're, they're the ones who allowed me to make those transitions. I hope all the trainees here at UIC is hearing this, you know, <laughs> the acknowledgments of the importance of our trainees. And in particular, you know, I want to thank the students from the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics, who are the co that department is co-hosting with us. So, so it was an excellent selection. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. I think Alam uh, Al Kavmadi is going to present some questions. I yeah. might just quickly, Alam, are you ready? Yes. yes. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Cantley. So, the first question is: What is the role of PIP3 in mTORC2 mediated AK2 S473 phosphorylation? Do you think AKT is in, involved in the middle of this regulation? If yes, how? Uh, so <clears throat> let me see if I get it straight. Phosphorylation of AKT at 473. Is this a question about 473 versus 308 or? Uh, so it's what is the role of PIP3 in mTORC2 mediated AK2, AKT S43 phosphorylation? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's still a little bit controversial uh, as to whether PIP3, I think it's right. I mean, I, I'm an author on the paper and you know, we didn't do the critical experiments in the paper, but uh, the paper, there was a paper showing that PIP3 will recruit TORC2 to the plasma membrane. And so I think that is true that, it, that there, there are other ways to get TORC2 to the plasma membrane as well. So. But um, yes, bringing TORC2 to the membrane, so can plus 473 is also playing a role. Thank you for that. Um, another question is how do lipids, including those at the cell membra membrane level, impact PIP3 and its ability to phosphorylate 
uh, AKT and or PDK1. Could the fatty acids on these PIPs play a role in how well PIP3 phosphorylates these protein subspace? Yeah, that's actually a good question because that was the very first thing we looked at when we saw the migration within layer being slightly different. I said, well, okay, uh, the fatty acids uh, could also change the migration on thin layer if you have different uh, linked fatty acids or uh, saturated versus unsaturated. And so we actually never published it, but we did an HPLC reverse phase column of the radioactive lipid product, uh, the type one and the type two. And uh, it turned out that you got a shift in the peaks, but they, otherwise they paralleled like, you know, 30, more like probably a hundred peaks of different uh, lipid compositions got all switched out on the HPLC, separated out, <clears throat> but they you got the same ratio of all lipids. So that single <clears throat> single experiment, which we never published, said to me that the enzyme doesn't care at all what the fatty acid is on the phosphatidyl and inositol, it will phosphorylate it, uh, whether, as long as they're normal like the fatty acids that stay in the membrane, they'll get, it'll, it'll, get, it'll phosphorylate them. Uh, was the question also whether there might be other lipids in the membrane that would influence the activity? Yes. Yeah, that's also a really good question. That one, we had one experiment uh, or a set of experiments about 20 years ago in which we purchased uh, uh, lipids from Sigma that uh, gave us much higher enzymatic activity than we had previously gotten with other preps. And when we tried using individual purified lipids to reconstitute to see whether we could get that greater activity, uh, no one was ever successful at reproducing what came along with that sigma preparation, <clears throat> the mysterious preparation of sigma lipids. And I think uh, there is something else <laughs> in the membrane that we haven't yet discovered that will further activate PI3 kinase. But I challenged the people in the lab and, and a few, there were a few takers, but nobody won the money. <laughs> it was going to be a bottle of champagne, but nobody got it. Um, I think we have time just for one more, and then um, and then Dr. Kanievsky can um, can present our closing remarks. So, um, can one modulate PIP2 formation to modulate PIP3 formation via PI3K and the downstream targets? Yes, yes, you can. In fact, we published a paper on that uh, just a year ago. It turns out there's another family of lipid kinases called the PI5P4 kinases that uh, play, uh, they, they can convert phosphatidyl cell 5P to PI45P2. We discovered those in 1997, I think it was. And, um, and we spent many years, mouse knockouts and all, trying to figure out what they do and what they're important for. And uh, the enzymatic activity is important, but it turns out the major role they play is by uh, sequestering the activity of the type one enzymes. In other words, the type twos are much more abundant by tenfold over the type ones. And when you knock them out, the type one enzymes become more active. And as a consequence, we get more PIP3 produced from the same amount of insulin if you knock out those enzymes. So they are suppressing uh, they bind directly to the type 1 enzymes and suppress their activity. So that's, uh, that tells us for certain that if you can make more PIP2, you'll end up making more PIP3. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Cantley. Dr. Kiedewski? Well, uh, Dr. Cantley, th thanks again for just a fabulous talk. You know, in our catchment area in Cook County, women's cancers is a huge issue. And, you know, we invite our community to participate in how we do our science and, and you know, your talk really um, assures us that you will, you and your efforts at Cornell are going to make an impact both indirect and directly with, with the broad problems related in women's cancers. I think notably in endometrial cancer, which is on the rise based on the increase in BMI. So, Good luck with your efforts to, to help find novel treatments for cancers that are driven by PI3 kinase. And thank you once again for a, for a fabulous talk. We, we very much appreciate your participation in this distinguished seminar series.
Well, thank you. It's, it was a real pleasure, and I look forward to talking to your colleagues this afternoon, some of whom I'm good friends with. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, we'll see you soon, and and uh, all for on behalf of all of us at UIC, thank you so much.